Oh, Pumpkin, look at you. You found your light. You're looking pretty. I'm surprised. You're always looking pretty, right? But where you, you gotta leave? I'm sorry. I forgot. You have an appointment. You have important places to be. Hey, hey what's up, garden friends? Jeff here, Tropical Plant Party. That's too bright. That's too bright. How's everybody doing? I hope you're good. I am great. Fantastic. The sun's out. It has been cloudy for an entire week. All week. It's been so gloomy and rainy cold i might add i haven't even been out here since the last video y'all saw i the wind took the frost covers off the adenidia palms and i was like yeah that's fine because it had warmed up enough that they were okay everything's a mess just like it was in the last video because like i said i haven't really been out here or done much because it's been really cool and just pretty it's just gross out one thing that i thought might be good to talk about and have more of a dedicated video on even though this is more vlog style a little bit more laid back i get asked every single year and i address it in the vlogs but they're always like tucked inside of like hour-long vlogs of just chaos the question is what i do to get the bugs off the plants before i bring them inside for the winter which is a good question like i said i do address that every single year when i move the plants in but it's always tucked in and hidden away with things is this bothering anybody else i'm gonna go ahead and get these set up right gather some supplies and then we can talk about get the plants cleaned up and ready to get in the house without taking bugs inside with them all right so i've gone ahead i grabbed several plants that looked like they could use some tlc and some cleanup thought these might be better examples to work with for this video the way i have to do things is fairly different from i feel like a lot of people because i move several hundred plants in the house versus you know like a dozen or so i, th I thought it might make more sense to go over this process at a more uh, relatable way than the way I have to do things. I can talk about what I do at the end of this. I thought it might make more sense just to go over with smaller house plants and then maybe talk a little bit about what to do with floor plants. I have a whole bunch of different things laid out here on the table. Not all of them are things that I think people will need. I just wanted to make sure I had different examples out to talk about different oils soaps, fungicides, those sorts of things. For all the process I typically follow goes pruning, rinsing, spraying, soaking if necessary, and then rinsing again if necessary. It's important to go ahead and get any old dying foliage off of the plants. See this calathea here has some cold damage on it, has some bug damage on it. This makes sense to go ahead and get these gross off the plant now before taking it in the house. But in general, just a good thing to do before rinsing the plant off. Thing with some brown edges or anything like that, you know, keeping plants outside can be kind of harsh on the plant. So it's typical to have some spots and discoloration. That's not terribly unusual. Like I said, you can see there's a little bit of cold damage over here on some of those leaves. So go ahead and get those cleaned off. It's going to be the same here for this Tretiscantia here. This is the Nanook. I go through anything I just pull off with my hands. I'll get off of there, get the debris off the surface of the soil because I'm going to give these a light soak and anything I can get out now that won't be floating on the surface, just may as well do it now, right? Less to have to clean up and mess with later. Any weak or limp grows like these, I'll go ahead and cut those off and potentially repropagate them. This one's kind of dehydrated. So I don't really know if I want to propagate that, but one thing I wanted to mention is just biosecurity overall. So between every single plant that I use my pruners on, I like to make sure that they get sanitized. This is just a spray bottle with some rubbing alcohol in it. It'll give that a spray. Give it some time to disinfect between uses and do other things in between. Just that way, if there was something going on with this plant, I'm not going to be spreading it to all the others. It's good to get these dry bits and the dead leaves off the plants because really it's just less space for bugs and insects and critters and things to hang out. You can see the reason this one is so weak is because it had already been snapped. So I'll go ahead and hold on to that. Can propagate that in a glass of water or something later. And then I just repeat the process with all these other plants. Go ahead and get any old nasty foliage off. It's important to make sure to explore everything underneath and on top because there can be lots of dead stuff sometimes hanging out inside the plants. And once I have the plants fairly well cleaned up, I probably could have done a little bit more pruning on there, but this is just for example, you get what I'm saying. That's when I take the hose and blast the undersides of the leaves very, very heavily. Good to make sure to get the sides of the pots, the undersides of the roots, and go back and get the top of everything. Man, I'm sure you get it. The whole point is just to give the plant a nice shower. This will help blast off any bugs or critters that are hanging out down inside the leaves. It's always the undersides and then in between everything. That's where things always get really tricky and it's a lot easier to miss things. Do the top again. I'll usually repeat this two or three times with smaller plants. All right, so there is some pruning, 
some rinsing. Now it's time to go ahead and give these a soak. For that, I just use a bucket, one that I've already cleaned out. Not that that really matters, because I'm about to get it dirty, but you know what I mean, just something that hasn't had any chemicals in it. Then here I have roughly, I don't know, maybe two tablespoons of dish soap. It's best to use ones that don't have any detergents, dyes, or fragrances in them. This is just Dawn dish soap. Some people say to never use it. I've never had any problems with it before. Usually too terribly hard to find some nice all natural organic dish soaps. The one I used did have some dye in it, but that's okay. I've used it many times with the plants and it was all right. Prefer to not use ones like that, but it's all I had around. And like I said, it's always been fine in the past. If I were working with plants that had some really delicate roots on them, well, Calathea is kind of delicate roots. It'll be fine. Allow me to backtrack just a moment. I had filled that container with dish soap to use in my spray bottles and to use in this. So cut that in half, like maybe half a tablespoon, a few teaspoons. This is this is a bit much. Plants I'm using for this, they'll be fine. I'll give them a really heavy rinse, but this is this is a little bit excessive. Generally, you just need like a thin layer of foam on top. This is this is a lot. They weren't necessarily hoping to go to the spa and have a bubble bath. A bubble bath. I don't know if that's something you do at the spa. So now I just take the plants. I'll go ahead, push them down, make sure the air bubbles come out. I'll allow the plant to soak in there for like 15 to 25 minutes. This is a lot of soap, so I don't think I need to let it soak for quite that long. But since it's extra foamy, I may as well go ahead and try and get some of that foliage down in there. I'll help get any eggs or bugs off of them. The main reason to even do this is to make sure there aren't things hanging out in the roots. There could still be air pockets inside those root balls, so you're not guaranteed to get everything, but this is a pealy good start for helping make sure that there's no ants, mealybugs, those sorts of things, things that'll go down below the soil. And time's up. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that out, let it drain down in there, give this an extremely, extremely thorough rinse because that was a little bit more soap than I had intended, a little bit more than I would normally use. Regardless of whether or not I had used too much soap, no matter what amount of soap I would use here, I still like to go through and make sure that everything gets a really good rinse down around the roots. So I will usually let water flush through there, like, I don't know, maybe five times. Just as many times as it takes for me to not see suds down around the roots anymore. Here's where the strainer comes into play. Some people will go through and use these strainers to help lift out any gunk or debris that floated out from the plant that was in there prior before moving the next plant in there. But while this is very effective, I don't really tend to do it that often just because they're just gonna keep getting dirty and I'm gonna be rinsing these pots off one more time before they go in anyways. It does help get out any large chunks, any like dead leaves or something like that, whatever floated up from the pot. And then this is where I would repeat the process, move on to the next plant, get it down in there, let it soak for a while. The only issue I have with this is biosecurity. If you have a really large collection or if you perhaps have a plant that is kind of sickly, maybe you don't know why, like you've been taking care of it, but it just isn't growing right, then maybe skip this for those sickly plants because there's no guarantee that the dish soap that's being used to soak the plant is going to kill viruses or funguses. The main point of the soap is to help smother any eggs and any insects that are in there. When working with a lot of plants, it's a good idea to make sure that you're not soaking anything that looks sickly or even to make sure to change the water out fairly frequently just to avoid spreading any diseases around from plant to plant. This is fun. My tripod broke. I'm holding my camera right now and it's supposed to be attached right there. I just have to try and have a very steady hand for the rest of the video. And then sometimes people will use peroxide in these soaks. I've done that before, but I only do that if I know that there's some sort of infestation where I need to do that, some sort of mold or fungus, tons and tons of ants, something like that. Otherwise, I avoid the peroxide nowadays. It can kill off beneficial things, things that the plants need around their root systems to help with the nitrification process. Soap can do the same thing too. So that's why it's good to use one that doesn't have detergents, scents, don't use an antibacterial soap, just plain old dish soap nothing special about it without any sorts of additives or anything like that. That'll just help smother any bugs, bug eggs, and keep things a little bit safer. What about succulents though? You might have been wondering, well, how do we soak these plants that don't want a lot of water? That, I just like to make sure I really plan ahead. So like this Nanook, this Tradescantia was bone dry. So having a soak for a few minutes isn't going to hurt the plant or kill it. But if you're working with something that really does not want to be watered, then I probably wouldn't do the soak. There are plenty of cactus and plenty of succulents that 
could rot if you were to go ahead and soak them like this when their soil was already moist. It needs to have dried out for a few days just to be safe. Okay, now that the plants have all, well, almost all of them, the stromanthi is still soaking, but now that they've had their prune, their rinse, their soak, now it's time to talk about the foliage. What do we do with bugs that are on the leaves? This is where things get a little bit more complex just because there are a lot of choices and it's kind of like a to each their own sort of thing. When possible, I like to keep things natural. I don't really like to resort to using chemicals unless absolutely nothing else is working. So there are various things that I'll work with. A lot of people, including myself, this works very well. We'll just take a water bottle with some lukewarm water in it, but just a little drizzle of soap in there. Same thing, just dish soap, just like what I did over there in the bucket. Then I come over to the plant, make sure to get the undersides of the leaves and the tops give it a really, really, really heavy drenching. I'll help take care of what's going on above the soil. Usually I'll let that sit on there for at least an hour or two. You really probably don't even need to do it that long and then I will give the plant one last rinse on the foliage, the undersides of the foliage, and then I'll also use a sponge at the same time to go ahead and get the pots cleaned up so they look a little bit nicer and more tidy when they go in the house. There are other options from dish soap. Like you can see right here, this says peppermint oil on it. I love using peppermint oil on the plants. Neem oil is really popular for a very good reason. I just, I cannot stand the smell of neem. So I don't use it as often as I use the peppermint oil. With this, I just fill this bottle up and it says right there, one to two tablespoons. It needs to be potent. Like it'll kind of make your eyes water a little bit. It's very strong. So the thing I like about using peppermint oil is that it smothers. So it'll cover the exoskeletons of the insects and kill them off just like neem would. It's also a deterrent to things like spiders. Spiders hate peppermint oil. This is one of my favorite things to use if there's a lot of spiders. Where I live in the fall time, the spider population just becomes absolutely rampant. And I, I don't mind spiders. I'm not afraid of them. I think that they are fantastic for the environment. I don't try and kill them when they're outside. However, I don't necessarily want them all over my house. So that's one of the reasons I really like peppermint oil. But circling back to neem, because neem is probably one of the best things to use between the dish soap, peppermint oil, or just horticultural oils and soaps. The reason neem can be beneficial, I'm just pretending there's a neem in there. It turned out I'm out. I thought that I had neem, but this is fungicide. But that still brings me to my point. Neem is also a natural fungicide, which is why it's so great because it's sort of a two for one there. It's going to be good for smothering insects and getting those off the plants, killing them off the plants, that is. And then it's helpful for preventing rot and those sorts of things. I just, I don't have any. I do use neem, but only like when I really need to. I usually use these things by default, dish soap, peppermint oil first and then I'll use neem only because I just detest the smell. And I apply that just the same as I did with the dish soaps, spraying the tops, the bottoms. The main thing is just to make sure that that spray can rinse down and get into all the various nooks and crannies in the plants because that tends to be where all the bugs and critters like to hang out. Not everybody does a second rinse after they use their soaps or oils on the plants. Some people will just leave that on the foliage. That's all really going to be up to you and what you think is best. The reason I like to give it a second rinse is just because I don't want anything cloudy drying up on top of the foliage. I don't want there to be any films on the surface of the leaves, anything that could block sunlight from being able to get in there and allowing the plant to photosynthesize properly. Then another great thing about using the diluted soaps, using a soap solution to clean the foliage, it helps get the dust off of everything. It just makes the plants look nicer. It helps get things clean and shiny. The oils don't really do that. That's why I default to soap and then I'll use the oils, whether it be peppermint, neem, any other type of horticultural oil. I use those when I know there's a bug problem. When I'm just trying to be preventative, if I'm not already seeing mealybugs or spider mites, something like that, then I'll just use a soap. However, if it's a plant that's like really prone to something like spider mites, plants like bananas, colocaceas, alocaceas, those sorts of plants, then I might use an oil because oils are better at smothering the plants and helping to be more preventative with having those infestations to begin with. And you can also go ahead and do a soap let it sit for a while, rinse it off, and then use the spray with an oil if you want to. There are lots of options out there, lots of different methods and things that you can try. It's good to be mindful of whether or not a plant is really delicate. Plants like ferns are going to be more sensitive to the soakings and the sprays. Bromeliads, the same things. A lot of orchids. Well, heck, even the calatheas, they have pretty delicate roots. This one right here, the fusion, I've noticed is a very tough calathea, so it's not one that I would really worry about with the soaps. And now, what about plants that you can't just fit in a bucket. That's when 
I like to break out my mitts or a sponge. That'll work too. Use this Edenidia palm here, for example. Now, obviously, this plant is way too big to just drop in a bucket and give a soak. I'd still prepare this plant very similar to how I would the others. Go ahead, rinse the pot off. Get up in there. Give the plant a good rinse, especially in the crown. Don't want to do this if it's too cold outside because you don't want to rot the plants out. You don't want too much water collecting centers of the plants so if it's not necessary. The undersides and the tops of the foliage. Overall, just doing my best to give them a really heavy rinse, spray all the bugs off. And then with the soil, if I can't soak it in a bucket, I'll just take a bucket with just a little bit of dish soap in there, not as much as I used before, probably a teaspoon at the most. Pour that in there, I'll leave it alone for like 15, 20 minutes, and then take my hose and then give this plant an extremely thorough rinse to go ahead and make sure I'm getting all that soapy water out of there. If there's a little bit left behind, it's okay as long as it's not a delicate plant like I mentioned before. That's why it's good to use a weaker soap solution than when you're actually soaking them directly in the bucket. Just to be safe, it can be a little bit more difficult to make sure you really have gotten all that soap out of there. And then to clean the leaves up, I'll use a bucket, again, with just some soap in it. Then if I don't need to spray the plant down, if I haven't actually seen bugs in there, then I'll go ahead and use these gloves that I got from the dollar store, put them in that soapy water. I'll go ahead and gently run the frog through my hands or leaves whatever I'm doing this with through those gloves H having that pressure on there will help smush anything this helps get that soap dispersed onto the foliage and again I'll let that sit and just use the spray bottle too of course you don't have the gloves get up there get on top of everything make sure to get into all the crevices any place that the insects and creepy crawlers the critters can be hiding I mean I think you get it I need to prune that frond off that's an old one and it's just a modified version of everything we already did oh I almost forgot I still have another plant here that needs to be sprayed and rinsed I can't forget the stramanthi. And there you have it. That's pretty much the basics of it. The way I typically do things is more what I showed with that Edenidia palm. When I'm moving my plants inside, I move them over to my driveway. I get them into a big group, do the pruning, then do a rinse, and then I'll go ahead and spray them, let them sit for a while, give them a rinse, and then I hit everything with DE powder. That's the only thing I didn't include here. And that's because I think that a lot of people probably don't want DE powder inside their house. Since the majority of my plants are going into my grow space, I don't worry about that as much. And DE powder tends to go all over the place, so it's something I prefer to put on the plants outside before I'm moving them in. I do it in my driveway, that way I don't have to worry about getting onto any flowers or hurting any pollinators or anything like that. But anything I'm moving into the house, I don't do that DE powder with, because it's just, it's too messy. It needs to be rinsed off after a few days because it puts a white coating on top of everything. It's very effective though. I have a lot of plants that I move inside during the winter, so I tend to start the debugging process about four to six weeks before I even move them in. So the majority of the plants out here have already had a few soapy sprays, occasional hits with DE powder if they needed it. I saved the overall cleaning up of the pots and the last pruning and everything until it's about time to get them in the house. Yep, so there we go. That's what I do. Prune the plants, I rinse the plants, I soak the plants, I spray the plants, and then I rinse them again. Like I said, you don't have to rinse them again. That's really up to you. It's just my personal preference to give them a second rinse. And then I like to go ahead and make sure the pots are nice and clean give them one last spray down. Pretty simple. It's not guaranteed to keep the bugs from coming into the house, but it's going to get a lot of them off of the plants. Typically, you'll want to find a schedule that works for you for keeping your plants sprayed down in the house, probably weekly for the first month and then maybe cutting back to every other week. That's why it's good to use things that are safe, like the soaps and the oils, neem, those sorts of things. Neem is safe, but it is still risky for aquatic environments. Birds and reptiles might also have some susceptibilities to some issues with it, so it's still something to be careful with. Same to be said for soap though, right? I mean, need to use things sparingly and be responsible about how we use them. So you get the point. Look at the roots that this stromanthi, that this trio star put out this year. Isn't that insane? This one I keep in a self-watering planter. I know that calatheas can be issues for people sometimes. Try them in a self-watering planter. It makes all the difference in the world. As long as you keep the reservoir clean and don't let it dry out, it's all much easier to grow when you don't have to focus on making sure that you're constantly keeping these plants watered. I don't think I've ever had any calatheas die when I had them in a self-watering planter, unless the reservoir got too full and then the actual bottom of the pot, the soil was in contact with the water, and then there was root rot. But otherwise, they have always done really well. I still have some cleanup to do on this one. Okay, I'm gonna go though, lots of things to do, getting ready to move the plants inside. I hope everybody's doing well, having a great day and a great life, and everything's going beautifully for you. As always, comment down below. I love talking to everybody and offer your tips, tricks, suggestions, different things you do to help clean your plants up and avoid bringing the bugs in the house with them. Of course, as always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye. Bye.